Before the start of this video, I would just like to say a huge thank you to all my supporters across all platforms. Without your support, videos like the one you're about to watch would never happen. So huge thanks to each and every one of you. All role playing games involve some dice rolling in order to see whether or not actions have succeeded or not. Whether these be combat swings, gentle persuasion with an influence skill or evoking the power of their deities. They all require a skill roll and Mithras is no exception to this. However, within the Mithras rule set, there are different types of roles to see whether or not skills have been successful or not. And in this video, I'm going to be looking at those different types of roles in the Mithras rule set. My name's Inwells, and welcome to the In Crowd. Hello and welcome back. You have stumbled across another short rule video. Now, in these videos, I share with you some of the rules in a short video so we can concentrate on understanding them and quickly implementing them into our gaming sessions. So there are different types of roles within Mithras and what I would like to do in this video is have a look at each of these different types of roles in a little bit more detail and discuss with you when you would be successful in using these roles. Now before we go any further, please remember that all roles require a difficulty grading. So this will make the role harder or easier depending on the situation. And I'm going to talk about difficulty grading in a forthcoming video. OK, let's get rolling. So first up, opposed rolls. Now, opposed rolls are when two dice rolls are made and the scores are compared to each other to determine who has been successful. And with one person being successful, the other person fails. Now, with an opposed role, the first aspect we look at is whether or not the role has been successful relating to the skill level. So this means that the role has to be equal or less than the skill value. If one role succeeds and the other one fails, then the outcome is quite obvious. But what happens if both roles are successful? Well, in this case, the person or the player or the dice roll with the higher role succeeds. So if two characters are rolling the dice and they get scores of 45% and 56% and they are both successful, i.e. they are equal or less to their skills, then the person or the player who rolled the 56% will be the one who wins because that um, score is higher. The other thing to remember about opposed roles is that if one person rolls a critical success and one person rolls a standard success, then the critical will automatically win because there's a, a difference in the success rating or value there. So next up, augmented roles. Now, in most situations, there's only one skill that the player needs to roll. But there are some cases when a secondary skill may be used to augment the first one. So let me give you an example. Say um, Hengis is walking down the streets of Lindo and he's trying to see whether or not there's some um, ruffians, some thugs ahead and or that he's being followed. And I might say as the GM, right, you have a streetwise skill, so that's going to augment your perception. OK, so 
knowing that streetwise skill is helping the character see what's going on, whether or not they're being followed or there's an ambush set up. Now, in order to augment the role, the secondary skill, the one that is going to be supporting the first skill, you actually find out 20% of that skill or double its crit rating of that skill. So say, for example, somebody has a perception of 50% and a streetwise of 47% then the amount that the perception will be augmented will be 20% of the 47. So we can easily work out that 10% is 4.7. Doubling it to get 20% will be 9.4. So there will be an increase in 10% for that um, perception skill. And that would be a temporary increase just for this situation. So next up, differential roles. Now, with opposed and augmented roles, there's always been a winner and a loser, the person who succeeds and the person who doesn't succeed. Well, with differential roles, how successful the role is or the action is, is determined by comparing the two roles together to each other. So differential roles are primarily used in combat. And with these roles, what we do is that we look at the difference between the success be to see what actually happens in, in the combat. So with differential roles, it is possible for both roles to succeed and the outcome to be adjusted accordingly. So there is a table on page 51 of the core rule book that shows you all the differences, but it's quite easy to work out in the following way. Well, I think so in any case. So if you keep in mind that there are four levels of success, there's critical, standard, failure, and fumble. Okay, so those are the levels of success. So rather than actually looking at the dice rolls what we and comparing them, what we do is we compare the level of success. So if both rolls result in standard successes, then there is no difference between the two levels of success. However, if one is a critical success and the other one is a standard success, then there is one level of success difference because critical, standard, there's the one level of difference. Now, there, that could be even higher. For example, if there's a critical success and a failure, then the, the difference of success rating is two because you've got critical standard failure, so forth and so on. Now, the only time that this does not um, almost like implement is that if both roles are failures or and or fumbles, you know, if, if somebody fails and the other person fumbles, then the person who fail, fails hasn't got one level of success. It's only if the skills, if one of the skills has actually succeeded. So let's think about this situation. And I mentioned before that this really applies for combat. So if both combatants scores a standard success on their to hit and parry roll, then the damage would actually be halved or ignored depending on the size of the weapons that they're using to parry. But because if somebody gets a critical and a success, then there is one level of difference. So that person will be able to get a special effect as well as doing the half damage. Now, if somebody gets a critical and the parry is a failure or a fumble even, then there will be two or even three levels of success difference. And so they will get two or three specials, some of which can be a critical. And yeah, it can get a little bit complicated, especially with specials flying around the place. But if you want to know more about combat in Mithras, then I've done a more in-depth version when I didn't have a beard. And you can find, I'll link it in the comments below or put a card up here somewhere to it. Okay, so next up are group 
roles. Now, there's often situations when you might be GMing a whole group of individuals. So this might be a group of bandits or the party or, or the hirelings or something like that. So what I'm about to um, talk about, I these group roles, I actually use that a lot when I have rabbles and or I'm implementing the rabbles and underlings rule. Now, I've done a video about this as well. So the link will be up there or in the comments below. So there are actually two types of group roles. There is the team role and there is the sorting role. So I'm going to talk about the team role first. So when you're doing a group role, the team role way, then the person or the character with the highest skill rolls the dice and if they fail or succeed then the whole group either fails or succeeds it doesn't matter on anybody else's dice roll or anything like that it's just one roll for the person who's the best at it and if you imagine that could be in the end in the instance if we're having you know stealthing roles or hiding roles for an ambush that person might be giving directions or encouraging people to crouch down hence why it could be for the group so let's Think for an example, you know, bandits are hiding in an alleyway and Bartleby is walking home from a late night prayer session with a local. The thug with the highest stealth score has 58%. He rolls and if he succeeds, then everybody succeeds and they are kept hidden and Bartleby is unaware of them. However, if they he fails, uh, i.e. he gets higher than his 58%, then Bartleby will see them all. And there's no change, okay? They, you don't get a chance to roll differently or anything like that. One roll, that's it, all done. So the second type of group roll is called a sorting roll. And in this case, you roll a dice roll w once, just like the team roll, but you compare it to the different skill levels within the group. So let me give you an example. Let's go back to Bartleby walking down the street. Okay, so the street thugs have a range of stealth skills. Say they range from 27 percent. I'm not too sure who brought that one along up to, say, 58%. So as a GM, I make one roll and I will roll my dice and I will get, say, 42% on my dice roll. Now, what this means is that any bandit whose skill level is 42 or higher will remain hidden. So the person who had 58%, that's he's or she have remained hidden. OK, because it's less than their dice roll. However, the poor street thug with 27 percent in the skill, because the dice roll was 42, this is higher than his or her dice roll. And so, yeah, he sticks out like a sore thumb. They probably decided to hide behind a very narrow pole somewhere and Bartleby sees them straight away. So the final type of group skills success role, and we really shouldn't call it a role, is called a proportional skills success. Now, in this situation, we are looking at a large group of people or thugs or whatever. And what we do is that we, rather than rolling dice to see what happens we look at generally their skill score so say for example um, uh, their stealth skill was 58 percent then rather than rolling dice or anything like that we literally say right their high skill roll is 48 percent so 48 percent of them all succeed and the rest fail so Going back to the street thugs, you know, if you remember that their um, high skill was 58%. So rather than doing rolling or anything like that, I would literally say, okay, then there's 58, the high skill level is 58%. So 58% of 
the thugs succeed. And that's it. OK, now, yes, remember, you're going to have to do some rounding here because it's not possible to have 0.32 of a thug unless that means that the majority of their body is hidden, but their foot can be. No, no, let's not go into that. Just round up. And that's it. All the very important roles in Mithras explained in this short video. Please consider liking, commenting and subscribing to the channel. I really appreciate all the support that people provide and it moves me ever closer to my dream of being a full time content creator. Remember, if you have any rules that are baffling you or you would like me to explore in a video, then do let me know in the comments below. So until next time, I hope all your opposed roles are successful and reward you with a well-deserved special. Happy Mithrasing, everyone. See ya. Bye.